Hi, I'm Mary Bosworth. I'm Director of Border Criminologies and I'm here today with Vicky Canning who is one of the Associate Directors of Border Criminologies and we're making this short film for International Women's Day 2020. Um, we're here today to discuss Vicky's work on women seeking asylum in Britain, Denmark and Sweden. So Vicky, how did you start in this area? Well, I used to work with uh, a local organisation on rape crisis and mm -hmm. felt that there was some gaps in terms of the ways in which we respond to women seeking asylum um, who've experienced violence in conflict and during migration. And I think back in those days when you have this idea where your priority is, oh, we must find support for uh, women who have been subjected to, women that I'd met had experienced multiple perpetrator rape, various forms of domestic violence, abuse, um, violence that I would define and has have defined as torturous violence. So while not seen as torture legally, um, I would consider it to be torture. And then I actually realised that the kinds of borders that women were experiencing were so um, intrusive in the everyday that actually being able to even get to this point of engaging in support, whether it's um, you know counselling or psychosocial or anything, this was impeded further. So it started to become clearer that actually the everyday kinds of borders that we see, you know, in terms of time, poverty, destitution, maybe being tied to spousal visas, um, these were causing further problems in terms of actually being able to access support. So it became more evident that the borders were compounding problems rather than solving them and sometimes even, you know, impacting negatively on women's mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I started to maybe change from my priorities to recognise that women's priorities were not the same as my right. original objectives. And how did you move from working on this in terms of, of um, being engaged in, with a civil society organisation and with women themselves, in, how did you move from that into an academic study? It's always a good question between, as because I would be call myself an activist and an academic, and sometimes I feel more comfortable in activist settings than I do in academic mm -hmm. settings. Um, but effectively, I think um, being able to use the same kind of of grassroots organisational skills and think about how to engage people, um, especially in the northwest of England at the time in in Liverpool, and. Um, I think again, when, when we start to recognise some of the kinds of harms of, of governmental policies around us, you start to recognise that maybe we, these are the discussions that we should be having in academia rather than the original discussions that we might think are priorities. So it was more about um, thinking about how to, to move what you can actually see in the everyday into what we prioritise in terms of evidence, empirical research, and uh, you know, distributing what we see and what knowledge we produce from it. Mm -hmm. And since you are um, a criminologist, was there, was there any pushback about including this population within a criminological study? Did anyone ever say to you, that's all very interesting, but that's not criminology? Or, or is it because the, the harms that the women have experienced were crimes, does, does it fit more easily into the discipline? Mm. Um, I don't think it fits into the discipline very well at all, um, and I think that I've, you know, there are con there are tensions between my work on criminology because I would say that uh, criminology in itself still uses the same quite well, not not all the time, but um, beyond critical criminology, normative, often state centric approaches to regulations of. Of people and in the context of migration actually a lot of these things that you see in the everyday are not related to criminal justice whatsoever they mirror them um, they mirror social controls but I think that that fits in in two senses well I mean obviously in sociology and the sociology of deviance but certainly within semiology and how we start to think about how we study social harms and knit those with what we recognize are processes or that mirror processes of criminalization so I do it does fit and there are discussions about you know criminology particularly in the use of immigration detention which obviously you know you've like pioneered a lot of the UK's work on that so you know that there are these uh, knitting together mm -hmm. of, of uh, crime based agendas or, or criminalization based agendas but actually in what affects people in the everyday 
outside of detention or outside of um, people who are criminalised for migration related um, offences uh, is, is aspects of harm and also you know survive in harm mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and building forms of resistance to not only survive harm but actually to mitigate yeah. the ways in which it it exists and and perforates yeah every day so can you tell me a little bit about the kinds of um experiences that the women who you've worked with have had um either um, before they arrived or once they get into the asylum system in the three countries that you that you work on mm. Well, I think this is where uh, feminist work and theory practice and activism come in, is recognising um, so forms of continuums of violence. So rather than doing sort of mass interviews, generally I try to uh, spend time with women over periods of time, over months or sometimes years, um, in as a non-intrusive or invasive way as possible. Um, involved in different groups, grassroots organisations that I've, I've long been involved in. And that's about building with, with undertaking, so that would be undertaking oral histories. Mm -hmm. And with this you start to see structural violences in women's histories. So, you know, not being able to go to school in certain areas or um, experiencing uh, childhood sexual abuse. And then how sometimes these can develop, so women, um, women that I've met who've been in conflict uh, areas, have experienced multiple perpetrator rape or continuums of rape in their lives. Um, interestingly, and and also worryingly, I think, are the ways in which those continuums can both move across migratory journeys, but also manifest whilst in the the in asylum systems, for example. So there are certain aspects that I think women can experience that are a little uh, are quite unique. To, um, to gendered experiences of borders. So for example, in Denmark, um, in women who live in asylum systems, um, or sorry, asylum centers, these are often spatially excluded in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so this not only means that if you're a carer for kids, for example, you have more problems going back and forth to certain, you know, to a city or a town or to go even grocery shopping becomes a problem because you've got to pick your kids up at, 11 o'clock and then leave them back off at one o'clock or whatever the times are so you've got these kinds of spatial controls but also um i think further potentials for um violences including um exploitation as we've seen in immigration detention um in the uk as an example exploitation um from men who have been living in the area from harassment in in centres and this is not to say all men and this is of course you know one of the key issues is the dynamics of gendered violence are very complicated um, but what they what you can really um, evidence is that it's been very seldom that it's the women that I've worked with have had one-off experiences that said I also I think from the gendered harm book a few years ago a woman that I spent some years with doing an oral history or some months and followed up with you know one subjection to sexual violence in her life led to long-term physical implications she mm -hmm. contracted HIV um, mm -hmm. and became pregnant and mm -hmm. and uh, so so I think effectively there's multiple experiences that women can have and the women that I've met and and undertaken research with as part of, of as participants working but it's I think it's always important to emphasize that one doesn't undermine the mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. so one subjection to violence doesn't mean that everyone has experienced a continuum of violence it's that really in the everyday we should be reducing the impacts of previous violences and reducing the potential for further violence in women's lives mm -hmm. particularly with the recognition that um, you know, there are forms of violence from conflict related areas or during migratory journeys that can be disproportionately sub um, experienced by, by women who are seeking asylum. Yeah. And have you found um, substantial differences either in the women's experiences across the three countries or in the systems? I mean, are there, so as not to be 
totally sad all the time about mm. how the world is. Are there are there any practices in any countries which are are helpful to the to the women, which 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 are sort of having some positive effect that you've seen in the women you've worked with, or is the story everywhere just one of, of bleak despair? <laughs> Oh, I laugh because I, I bring everybody despair everywhere I go. Yeah, um, I think everybody does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably. But um, I think. I mean, it, it actually it is ironic because I don't feel despair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I all all the time. I think whenever I'm whenever I work at institutional levels, I really can feel despair and and grinding because you can see a lack of um, recognition between lived reality and these sort of ideas and policies that you just know are going to make people's lives worse and that is despairing to be mm -hmm. honest but you know for the years that we've worked that i've worked with for example the fantastic migrant artist mutual aid or right to remain the experience of um you know being part of a collective and seeing problem solving amongst uh women is is always I don't want to say I mean it is inspirational but I also at the same time you know I don't I don't like for example I mean I really problematize resilience literature mm -hmm. you know we can't have always happy endings and I think this there's a push for this in criminological literature where we like to have a happy ending for things that are you know really problematic and we can't have happy stories for white people about what borders are doing mm -hmm. at the same time um you know it's it's amazing to meet women who have been subjected to things that to be honest really i wouldn't be able to i know i wouldn't be able to come through some of the things that women that i've met have come through and to see organized and and take back power and control in in lives and in you know really really amazing ways um but at that same time i don't feel that people should be in the position where they have to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think at grassroot level, I feel like I don't always feel in despair, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wish that there were different ways in which we go about um, impacting on people who are, you know, stuck in, in border regimes or in, in these asylum systems. And so in, in the UK at the moment, one of the key terms that the state uses in trying to work with women is is this concept of vulnerability mm -hmm. so vulnerability and, and it's not just the state of course who uses that term it's also NGOs and, and civil society organizations um, are, are couching their gender-based policies in terms of women's particular vulnerability mm -hmm. do you have a view on on the utility of that as a as an organizing principle I do have a view <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> surprised <laughs> it's a shocker um, Yes, I do. I mean, I think that what has that the discourses have come out, which I hope I don't perpetuate, are that women are unable or, um, you know, totally disenfranchised in society. There is an aspect of disenfranchisement that is, that is placed through these complex webs of bordering and also through other forms of patriarchal controls. Let's be honest, I mean, sometimes I've known women for periods of time and then over months or years realize that the, the that the man that they're in a, a relationship is actually a violent relationship mm -hmm. that they she's been subjected to further forms of domestic violence um so you know not underplaying any of this that, that so the two things I, I mean the two things that i would say about vulnerability is that there is the best intention i think especially by ngos and advocates that working with women to recognize these um, structural disenfranchisements as being inherently vulnerable and we see this through discourse you know uh, women and children mm -hmm. um, and infantilizing of, of women many women who've you know made it through serious you know from persecution or torture or violence through migrating you know with kids often with them and then living for periods of time months years with no autonomy um, based on poverty, based on not being allowed to access or able to access higher education, these sorts of things. That vulnerability, that idea of vulnerability isn't reflective of what women, it undermines what women have managed to survive. Our real focus should be on so facilitating support in that sense 
whether it's sexual violence support or whether it's um, you know financial support or, or support to, to learn or whatever um, you know that we want to do as humans but also um, to support and end in the ways in which these impact on women and the kinds of ways they impact. Um, the other on vulnerability, which I find is the greatest irony of all, is to hear the ways in which um, maybe governments or people in parliament sometimes discuss vulnerability as if this is something inherent to women's identity without recognising that women are being made more vulnerable by state policies, by governmental decisions, by destitution. We know that whenever women, we know these things, these are not surprises, we know that if women are um, left in poverty, that the potential for forms of exploitation um, increase based on gendered inequalities. We know this. We know that if um, women have children and are forcibly dependent on partners, potentially violent partners, this, this facilitates further temporal vulnerabilities. These are not new knowledges. Mm. So there is a bit of a frustration for me that the same sorts of border regimes talk about vulnerable women and responded to vulnerable women when women themselves sometimes say um you know i don't see how i'm treated any differently by these housing officers coming in controlling me in my house um or you know uh the you know having to be dispersed at the last minute and having to move having to go and you know be signing on to the home office all these kinds of micro controls how these are any different to my violence, you know, from my from my my ex or my husband or whatever. Mm -hmm. That this is something that's a problem, you know. This these are extensions of a patriarchal state, and it's not enough to come up with ideas to stop this mythology of of inherent vulnerability. What we need to be talking about is ending the conditions under which women are more likely to be disenfranchised or exploited, which then leads to vulnerability in certain yeah. senses. Yeah, well I guess that's one of the issues is that vulnerability becomes a personal problem whereas what you're saying and mm. what we all know is that these are structural mm. issues and so it's that, it's that way in which somehow, somehow we need to keep reminding everybody to pay more attention yeah. to the structural causes. And just to say on that, just the last thing is, this also then brings us into really problematic victim dis you know mm -hmm. discourses mm -hmm. where if you are if you've survived trafficking or if you have survived um you know i've, I've met women who've been some of the women that i've worked with who've, who've been um forcibly imprisoned by partners for example mm -hmm. and you know subjected to repeated sexual abuses um if if you don't fit the perfect victim of this then you're not vulnerable enough yeah so we end up with scales of vulnerability unless and women i think women that i've that I know have, are, are aware of this and are so whilst you know if you have a bad day sometimes you think oh I want to I'm going to go out and do this or I'm going to do that or Vicky you're finally going to brush your hair this week after you know <laughs> sitting in this office writing whatever miserable thing that you're imposing on the world you know we do all these things as, as people I've you know women often I've had conversations with women who they feel like they can't get up and look like they're surviving yeah. because if they do they're not mm -hmm. victim enough they're yeah. not vulnerable enough that's not a fair or human way forward you know we need to i think this is i think that fits with a lot of other feminist mm. issues and objectives about what we expect in terms mm. of mm. you know vulnerability and femininity and this plays in we know this plays into you know court cases and appeals if you're not victim enough if you're not seen to be vulnerable enough then you are not. You're probably not credible enough to be a victim of victim of trafficking or mm. Mm. sexual abuse or yeah. So can I ask a rather dry question now, which is actually a yes. methods question. Oh. So so you 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 work with the same people or with a group of people for for fairly long periods mm. of time, and um, how does that work methodologically? Like, do you do you have a field note diary? Do you record mm. things? Is it and, and do you switch between roles? Like are you sometimes Vicky, the senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Bristol, and sometimes Vicky, mm -hmm. the support worker, or are you just Vicky? Like how do, how do you mm. navigate those, those different aspects? Well, I think I wouldn't, I would never say that I'm really a support worker. I try to intervene in ways that 
what I would what is deemed in academia to be like expertise, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, thinking about you know, does this refusal consider particular social groups or anything? We yeah. know, for example, like legal aid. Um, I can't give any legal advice, obviously, mm -hmm. legally. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that legal aid has been reduced, especially mm -hmm. for you know, fat right to family life cases, etc. But what is useful sometimes is, you know, if you can just pinpoint what this, so that you can, if you go through something, for example, you can pinpoint and say, this is, if you, if, you know, point this out to your lawyer, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. your lawyer who's got less time can take time, so you can, things like this. Or we, um, we put together, for example, a book, um, Strategies for Survival Recipes mm -hmm. for Resistance, um, to raise funds for legal aid, but also to get across information. So once you start to see these things, you think, you know, how do we get other people to see how awful it is to get this refusal? What how heartless refusals can can read and um, what it must feel like to say, yeah, we believe that you've been trafficked, but you're still not going to give mm. you, you know, we're still not going to give you humanitarian protection or refugee status or whatever. So there are different ways that you can use those sorts of skills, I think, to different advantages. I kind of, in terms of senior lecturing, I think, I mean, I've I've really actually have, I have to say I've really enjoyed since I've since I've been at Bristol I've been, um, given access to you know given to you know did I want to write two modules? Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone goes. I'd love to write two modules. <laughs> I have nothing else to do but write. No, but I've actually really enjoyed it. So on globalization, harm, crime, and justice, and another one on uh, violence, conflict, and forced migration, and supporting students and to see the kinds of violences in ways that are both structural and individual. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think a lot of the histories that come through, and I think for students, I feel like students are often undermined in what they want. So there's, a, there's this idea developed by certain mechanisms in the neoliberal university where students just want, you know, you know, tick box things or events or movies or whatever. Actually, one of you talk to students, they love to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and the discussions that you have from them actually some sort you know you learn back and forth don't you um but also i think it gives avenues for people to think oh where students might come and say you know where could i go and maybe do something that supports mm -hmm. in this way mm -hmm. so you can do all these different things obviously you've got a position of power when you're in in academia that you don't have in other places but when you're actually in the groups with the women mm. in the room with you, do they, are you there as a researcher? Is everything that you're witnessing, is that yeah. stuff that you could write about? Or do you have to sort of say, today I'm, today I'm doing research, mm. tomorrow I'm doing activism, mm. to keep them separate? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't use, um, I wouldn't use anything from my, like, activist. So you kind of, kind of imagine what I've been doing for years in activist senses, has been, you know, organising or working with, you know, everything from develop, you know, rallies mm -hmm. um, and protests to, you know, sitting cross-legged in a vegan collective with chickens walking around, mm -hmm. talking to women about what avenues they can go to to get support in, you know, sexual abuse support or something. So that is not what I would ever consider. If there is something that I think is particularly, so I might reflect in one example um, with a, I, I did reflect actually for a border criminologies blog, I think, um, on something that then did become, so I, I developed a, an asylum navigation board with Right to Remain. And it was a, a personal reflection, so I've, I've made no mention of, of the woman that I was speaking to, but the experience of, I think there is something about seeing about knowing what the structures are like in asylum and seeing the impacts of them on people mm -hmm. and reflecting on that yourself and thinking. Because that was a pivot, pivotal point, an accumulation of pivotal points where you think, you know, it's just not fair that people think that they are the failures in this. Mm -hmm. How do we find ways to recognise that actually the system is built like this and support people to know how to get, how to get through it um, or what problems that might be faced? So, I mean, in, every now and then there might be something that's a, like a vague reflection, mm -hmm. but otherwise these things are separate. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These things are separate un, unless women say... That, oh, actually, interesting, the, the other thing is, because I think there would be a problem if women only saw me as a researcher. Mm -hmm. I think there's an, there's an ethical dilemma there where 
you would only be hearing from women, for example, who've experienced violence, or there's that woman mm -hmm. um, who wants to talk about violence, you would never get actually a, a snapshot of what borders are like. Mm -hmm. You would be, you'd be, you know, targeted to to tell something mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I I've separate. Um, and so when you are doing research, do you do you take field notes or do you, do you record? Or I don't record. Mm -hmm. Oh, I record oral histories. Yeah. Um, I record oral histories because piecing together oral histories. I always say I'm never doing another oral history. And then uh, I think that the depth of what you can see from it in the mm -hmm. you know macro, meso and micro levels, um, I don't think you can get it in, in through other mm -hmm. methods. I don't, I don't feel anyway. I'm sure maybe other people do other methods much better than me. Um, but I record then. I have I have field notes otherwise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and whenever I'm in other spaces, sometimes um, just um, pictures of things that remind me of the day. So never people, mm -hmm. but you know just pictures of of you know something that might have reminded me of uh, like a, you know witnessing a deportation or something mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there's just like a smashed egg on the floor. I've got a mm -hmm. picture of a smashed egg, and it, it relates to other things that happened around mm -hmm. that. Um, which sounds really silly, but then it brings me straight back to remembering the discussions we had before the smashed egg and you know yeah. whatever. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, it's interesting the little the little things that that trigger memories. Whenever mm -hmm. I look at my field notes, I, I mine are often fragmentary, and then I'll have quotes that people have said, mm -hmm. and then I'll have sort of more fragments, and then it's just a matter of sort of sitting with them, and mm -hmm. then you you do go back to 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 what you experienced, and I've started trying to write. Uh, a sort of second lot of field mm. notes where I actually do much more detailed uh, just description of, of everything mm. um, but you can only do that if you have time and so and time's an issue time. the other thing though is it can really be really I find this can sometimes be absolutely horrible to go back to yeah. to field notes mm. um, where unless I really I had to recently for a, for a book chapter I'd been asked to write and I thought I should write this book chapter but I really really don't want to mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, and I went back to reflecting on um, what I would call a, a confinement continuum in Denmark. So there's a, the arrival centre, Santon, then a deportation centre, Shellsmark, and then a detention centre, Ellebeck. And remembering that day, and I was like, oh, you know, I think I tried so hard to get so much out of my memory that I then realised, God, how much I really hated that particular time. So that, I think, can also trigger stuff yeah. later on. So that takes me to my next question very neatly, <laughs> which is that you spend a lot of time with people who have had terrible experiences mm -hmm. and in spaces which are themselves um, very harmful and upsetting. How do you manage that? Well, Mary, this is why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, because this is what we do. Um, well, I... I manage it really well sometimes and I manage it not very well sometimes. Okay. Um, so when I manage it well, that's whenever I try to focus on, for example, writing about it mm -hmm. and um, working through things or, or even analysing stuff. And then that's whenever also I feel like I've got the energy to do some of the things like the, you know, the navigation board or the strategies for survival books with, with migrant artist mutual aid. Um, but Sometimes I have to say, um, you really do just feel like I, 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 I cannot bear, and and also when when the political environment continues to become worse, I cannot bear the trajectory in which I can see this is going, mm. and then I have to say like I don't know what it is that that is, maybe it's working class guilt or something, but you think it would not be acceptable ethically to have people invest so much of their time yeah. and you to not bother your self yeah. with uh, with discussing stuff or exposing stuff which sometimes it is about exposing stuff actually um, or about trying to find ways collectively to mitigate some of the harms or think differently about the harms as well so and that I think I have to emphasize that I don't think I always do that well either um, and so it's not to pretend that like oh so this is on me it's absolutely not that I make mistakes 
regularly on a daily basis um so it's it isn't that it's that you just think you know what a waste of other people's time but it is tough sometimes like and then you again then feel guilty about thinking that it feels tough because you think I'm not stuck you know I know people who've been who are now 14 and 15 years into um asylum system and just watching time go by no right to work living in poverty I have no right to I have no right to to sort of mourn my position in this um it's really difficult isn't it and I think it's difficult um on a secondary level which is that we are of course also teachers and so when you have students who are going out and doing this sort of work Mm. trying to prepare them for the sorts of emotions that they will feel and Mm. exactly this this issue how you how you manage your own emotions when you know relative to the people who you're working with they're Mm. they're they're you know fairly inconsequential but of course they are your own feelings and you have to manage your own feelings and you know, lots of painful feelings make it hard to be creative, so it's hard to write. Um, I think I think it's very much part of this whole field. Um, and I have no massively helpful suggestions other than I think a certain amount of time passing mm. helps. Um, but I know exactly what you mean about having to go back to field notes and then mm. reading it and remembering it and <laughs> not wanting to think about mm. it. And it's it's a strangely um, it's a strange part of academic work because it's so Mm. saturated in emotions Um, and in a way we've got to keep some of them in but we can't be Mm. overwhelmed by them so it's it's hard and I think the you know I think for me what we and I'm always banging on about the structural but there is a structural consideration here that I don't think universities always necessarily give Mm -hmm. and that is that there are some kinds of research that do require specific emotional investment or time um, that you can't work with a hundred students discussing violence because you cannot say if one student you know we forget we are all we are all humans Mm -hmm. some of us have survived violence some of us have been subjected to sexual violence Mm -hmm. you can't pretend that we don't have histories and I can't pretend that my students Mm -hmm. don't have histories Mm -hmm. so it's very difficult if you've got you know, especially as, again, you know, I mentioned the neoliberal university, but as we, you know, have these sort of finance models where we bring in more students, the less time we have to spend making sure actually our students are A, learning, and B, are they, are they all right with this topic? I can't pretend to know if they're all right in the rest of their lives, nor is it my job, I'm not a counsellor, but I can try and make sure that people are okay. If that capacity is, is reduced for me, I think that's a problem. So I would definitely, um, you know, I would definitely encourage universities and departments and institutions and you know all of these fa- you know faculties everything to take into consideration that the, you know the people around us are doing serious seriously uh, emotionally laborious mm. research but sometimes you know you also don't know what you're going to hear when you go into the field you don't know if you're going to spend the afternoon with somebody who's been subjected to multiple perpetrator rape or um, if it's going to turn into, and you know, this is the same with practitioners, you know, um, or or who you're going to spend the afternoon with. So actually, you know, then to be honest, getting up and trying to pretend everything is okay the next day is not always the most feasible. Mm-hmm. And that's whenever I think, you know, it's great to have solidarity and support amongst colleagues and mm-hmm. and friends, mm-hmm. um, and 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 the organisations. I mean, the organisations that I work with are are just brilliant. So they've always been sort of around but I think it's a, a really important point yeah sometimes for people forget to ask you how you actually are yeah no I'm glad we have our border chronologies what's happening yeah <laughs> <laughs> even right. if I am sometimes singing Celine Dion but yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that was I mean that's really the end of the questions that I prepared um I mean I had one other one which is about whether you think that um what the role is, I guess, of academic work in trying to bring about progressive social mm-hmm. change for women seeking asylum? Um, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I think, so I've just recently, recently been working on sort of a six point examples of how to do this and what we need to do, because I think that we should, we do need to support organisations and their agendas. So we do need to, you know, 
you know, open discussions about ending, for example, indefinite detention. But I also think that we are in um, disproportionately powerful positions where we can use language and call, you know, as they say back at home, call a spade a spade um, or a spade a spade in English. <laughs> um, you know, just say things as they are. We have, you know, we learn the, the theories, the concepts, we learn the language of power. Um, we need to use these languages of power and address them, speak about them and call them what they are. So I, I think, you know, we've talked about this in the past, about, you know, immigration detention, the discussions between reform. By all means, let's move towards short term agendas that make people's lives easier. But I think we should also be using those voices to say, listen, these are based in, in neo-colonial ideas and ideologies. This is based on national identity and racism. We cannot seriously talk about decolonizing the university, which is a very you know, big subject at the minute. We cannot seriously talk about this, um, not use the languages of power to address the other racist and nationalist issues that we see um, in our research and work through, um, through border criminologies and um, border related research. Good. I think we might end it there. Okay. <laughs>